I'm going to start in Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Once again, we're going to pick up where we left off last week. I started talking to you about freedom from oppression. By the way, is everybody OK today? I know I'm talking fast, but are you good today? Do you have a good weekend so far? Looking forward to Thanksgiving. If you don't, if you have if you need a Thanksgiving dinner, let us know. We're providing hundreds of Thanksgiving dinners for people that are struggling financially. And so many of our generous church members have given and contributed. So if you have a need at all, let us know. Come on. Thank God. We have such great people in this church. We don't want anybody. We don't want anybody having a, a, a bad holiday. We want everybody to be encouraged and everybody to be celebrated and to be able to celebrate. So um, it's just uh, so thank you. Let us know, please let us help you in Acts chapter 10, verse 38. I want to talk to you about how to stop suffering, how to stop suffering. I think a lot of times we adopt a belief system that God wants us to suffer. And yet Jesus took our suffering for us. He bore our sins and carried away our sorrows. And by his stripes, we're healed. There's something about Jesus wanting to set people free. And where we suffer is we're oppressed by things that weigh us down and rob us of our power to control our lives. You see, you you see what suffering is. And I'm going to get into this today. What suffering is, is it's it's the inability to control your own life. It's the when you believe other people have power to determine your happiness or that something that somebody did to you determines whether you're going to be happy or not. The suffering doesn't come from what they did to you. The suffering comes from your belief that what they did to you somehow determines the outcome of your life. And whatever somebody did to you is not the end. God can undo what anybody did. God can redo what anybody what anybody used to do that you need them to do again. God can redo it himself. God can undo it. God can outdo it. God will outdo, undo or redo whatever needs to be done in your life. That's how good God is. And when you put your trust in people, you're going to feel oppressed. So this is why Jesus, one of the things that Jesus did when he walked through this earth, as it says, Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. The first thing it says that Jesus did was he went about doing good. And you know why he went about doing good? Because he is good. He went about doing good because he is good. He went about doing good because he is good. He only does what he is. He is good. Therefore, he does good. You get a hold of that and you realize that God's nature never changes. His character never changes. He has always been good and he'll always be good. And that's why goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life, not every other day not some of the days of your life, but all the days of your life. Can anybody say amen to that? So he went about doing good and healing all which which is all inclusive. So no one is left out. No one is is rejected. No one is is forgotten by God. God doesn't forget anybody. He doesn't leave anybody out. He wants to heal all. And he says, heal all who were oppressed by the devil. So the devil is the source of oppression. So any time we see throughout history where a group of people were oppressed, yes, there was another group of people that brought the oppression, but it was the devil that brought it through them. It was the devil's idea to oppress people. Oppression is the devil's plan for people's lives. And what is oppression? It is it means to remove from someone. I started teaching you this last week to remove from someone the power to control their own life or their own future, to remove from someone the power to control their own life or their own future. Now, think about it this way. So we're talking about how to be free from oppression and in this case, how to stop suffering, how to stop suffering, how to stop suffering, the mental anguish that some people feel. I know the people in this room right now, you feel anxiety, you're suffering from anxiety, you're suffering from depression, you're suffering from low self-worth, you're suffering from the pain of your past, you're suffering financially, you're suffering emotionally, perhaps you're suffering physically, you're suffering in a relationship, you're suff suffering from the anguish of what somebody did to hurt you. And all suffering can be identified and all suffering can be stopped 
when we identify what are the beliefs that are causing that suffering? What is the belief? What is the mistaken belief that is causing this suffering? So, for example, when I believe that there's nothing that I can do about my past, like my my mistakes have done me in my mistakes have ruined me. If I believe that, then I'm going to live in guilt. I'm going to live in shame. If I think about my past and all the bad things that I've done in my life and all the bad things that been, have been done to me, I will live in guilt when I feel powerless to do anything about my past. I will feel guilt and I will feel shame. Notice my guilt and shame is not because of my past, but my guilt and shame is because I feel powerless to do anything about my past. How about my present situation right now? My present situation. I'm trying to give you a little picture of what oppression is in my present situation. If I feel powerless over my present situation, it will depress me. So I'll feel I'll begin to feel depressed, like I feel powerless. I can't do anything about my financial situation. I can't do anything about my health. I can't do anything about my relationships. I can't do anything about my my emotions. So I feel powerless over my present condition. That makes me depressed. Notice. My present condition doesn't make me depressed, but the fact that I feel powerless to do anything about it is what makes me depressed. And what about my future? So we talk about our past, our present and our future for a moment. What about my future? If I believe that my future is in your hands or my future is in somebody else's hands or my future is really out of my control, that there's nothing I can do about my future, that it's that everything is a life of fate. Uh, My life is going to end up exactly the way I was born to. If I believe that no matter what I do, I can't impact my future. I'm going to be afraid because when you don't know what the future holds and you don't think you can do anything about your tomorrow, then it will make you feel afraid about tomorrow. Fear only comes from a feeling of powerlessness. So it's not my future that makes me afraid. It's the feeling of powerlessness over my future that makes me feel afraid. Are you you hearing me? So powerless over my past makes me feel guilt. Powerlessness over my present makes me feel depressed and a feeling powerless over my future makes me feel afraid. This is how Satan oppresses us. He robs us of the knowledge. He he wants to prevent us from thinking or believing that we have power to do anything about it. You say, what do we have? How do we have power to do anything about our past? We have the blood of Jesus that washes away our past. What do we have? How do we have power over our present? We have the power to praise God in the midst of our situation. We have the power to give thanks in the midst of our situation. We have the power to to control the the temperature, to set the temperature where we want it to be rather than just read the temperature where it is. So we have power over our present by rejoicing anyway, count it all joy, praise God anyway, worship him anyway, uh, thank him anyway. Okay, so that gives us power. We have power over our future. How? By by the seeds we sow, like your future is in your hands. Whatever seeds you plant is what you're going to reap. So that gives us a sense of that's just one example of what gives us power over our future rather than feeling powerless over our future. We can change the seeds we sow. Therefore, we can change the harvests that we grow based on what God has given us seed, time and harvest. So what I'm trying to explain to you is so many people, they face life with a a fatalistic mentality, a doom and gloom mentality, a victim mentality, like there's nothing I can do about my situation, like I'm always going to be in this. I'm always going to have this weakness. I'm always going to have this problem. I'm always going to have this handicap. I'm always going to have this disability. I'm always going to have this problem in my life. That's the lie of the devil. The devil wants you to believe that because your mistaken belief makes you suffer. And so I want to identify the beliefs, the mistaken beliefs that are causing us suffering. And I I want us to turn the tables on the devil by renewing our mind to a new belief system that will deliver you from the pain of suffering so that no matter what you're facing, you know, you have power to do something about that situation. 
You have the power to pray. You have the power to forgive. You have the power to get up. There's so many powers that you hold. There's so many superpowers, so to speak, that you have in your life. And the devil wants you to think, no, you are in bondage to your past. You are in bondage to your present. You're in bondage to the uncertainty of your future. And you are not in bondage. Jesus came to set the oppressed free and to heal all that are oppressed of the devil and give you back your power and wake you up to the power that you have. So we go back and we we revisit our friend for a moment. Indulge me a little bit. Humor me. Let's revisit our friend in John chapter five for a moment that was lame for 38 years. His problem was not that he was just lame in his in his legs. He was lame in his brain. He was lame brained. He had wrong. He had a wrong mentality. He had a mistaken belief that caused his suffering. Now, watch this in John chapter five. So we see Jesus comes to um, this pool called Bethesda in verse two, the sheep gate. There's a pool in Jerusalem in Hebrew called Bethesda, having five porches. And in there lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame and withered. Now think about those conditions, sick, blind, lame and withered. Uh, That's the condition that everybody comes to. That's the condition everybody's in without Jesus. We are all sick in some way, blind in some way, lame in some way, withered in some way. Jesus wants to heal us and deliver us. And all these people were waiting for something. They were waiting for something. Now, here's what I want you to get. They were waiting for the moving of the waters because an angel of the Lord, the next verse says an angel of the Lord would go down at certain seasons into the pool and stir up the water. And whoever got into the water first after the stirring of the water was made well or was healed from whatever disease with which they were afflicted. So this is a pretty amazing, amazing pool that they were sitting by. And there was a man for 38 years who had been ill in the same condition. So now notice everybody's waiting. Everybody's waiting for the angel to come and stir up the waters. Everybody's waiting. You know, the problem is with a lot of Christians is we're just waiting for an angel to do something. You know, God on the other side of the cross, now that Jesus has died for our sins, we don't need to wait for an angel to do anything. You, you know, when you, when Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days, the Bible says he resisted the devil when he said it is written, it is written, it is written. He resisted the devil. And then the Bible says an angel came and strengthened him. So the angel didn't resist the devil. Jesus resisted the devil. And the lesson we need to learn in our lives is let's not wait for the angels to do what God created us to do. Let's not wait for the angels to do what Jesus has already done for us. He has saved us. He has healed us. He has died on the cross for us and provided everything that we need. We need to stop waiting now for it to happen and just believe it and receive it by faith. But anyway, they're all waiting there, waiting for the waters to be stirred. And here's this guy for 38 years. He's been lame and been in this condition. And when Jesus saw him lying there, it says in verse six, Jesus says to him, he already knew he was there for a long time. And Jesus says to him, do you wish to get well? Do you want to get well? Now, we went over this a little bit, but let's just again humor me for a moment. Do you want to get well? How many how many possible answers are there to that question? Well, there's two answers. There's two possible answers. There's really one right answer, but there's two possible answers. Do you want to get well? You could answer yes or you could answer no. Now, somebody there's always going to be smart Alec in the in the crowd is that, well, you could say maybe. But when it. (laughs) But just 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 humor me. There's really only two answers to this question. Yes or no. Do you want to be made well? Yes or no? It has nothing to do with your past. It has nothing to do with your future. It has everything to do with what you want. Do you want to be made well? And the man answered and said, well, what are the two possible answers again? Yes or no. And he says, "Um, 
Sir, I have no one, no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred. But when I'm coming, somebody steps in in front of me and he's he begins to go into this story of his of his pain. And see, this is what our our default mechanism in our soul is that every time we're faced with a choice, we we default to our old way of thinking and we have to change that. We have to disrupt that. We have to disturb that. today. I'm just uh, I'm disturbing you today. I'm stirring up the waters today so you can be healed. I want to disturb your thinking from always reverting back to your old way of thinking, which is to tell your story and to blame it on somebody else and to have a pity party. And are you encouraged yet? I'm not. I don't mean to point this out in your life, but I'm, I'm here to help you, to empower you. You're amazing. You're great. I mean, I'm here to encourage you, but I also need to dissect and and point out a faulty belief system that is keeping you defeated and keeping you lame in your life when God wants you to leap and jump and run and experience his life and experience and enjoy your life and be happy and be full of peace and and be a walking miracle and being I mean, having a pep in your st- step, man. I'm talking about a life that God intended life to the full till it overflows. The devil comes to steal, kill and destroy. But Jesus came to give you an abundant life. I'm just trying to help you. Trying to help you identify the 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 roadblocks to your blessing, the roadblocks to your miracle, the roadblocks to why. Why do I keep going back and telling my story? Jesus says, do you want to get well? And the man begins to tell his story and we all begin to tell our story, our sob story. You know, a sob story. It's your story about why you're in the situation you're in. You start making excuses. You start blaming. We have to realize that Jesus is pointing out a very common mistaken belief that we are victims. This is what this man began to describe himself as. I am a victim. I have no one to put me in the water when the waters are stirred. It's a victim mentality and God wants to deliver us from it. And it shows up in these kinds of thought patterns where you're constantly blaming other people for where for where you're at. You're easily offended. You um, you possess a life is against me philosophy. You see your problems as catastrophes and blow them out of proportion. You think others are purposely trying to hurt you. You're not lighthearted. You've lost your sense of humor. It's hard to take things lightly. You take everything really heavy. Everything is gloomy. You take things way too seriously. Uh, Even when things go right, you find something to complain about. You believe you're the only person suffering in this way. You feel you refuse to consider other people's perspectives perspectives when talking about your problem. You feel powerless and unable to deal with your problem in general. You feel attacked when somebody's giving you constructive criticism. You believe that everyone is better off than you. You seem to enjoy feeling sorry for yourself. Am I touching a nerve yet? Yeah. Or somebody, you know, uh, you have a habit of blaming and attacking and accusing those that that you love for how you feel. You're blaming them for how you feel. You, um, you You feel powerless to change your circumstances. You expect to gain sympathy from others. Uh, And when you don't, you feel upset. You refuse to analyze yourself or improve your life, but you analyze others and and you try to improve them. You tend to one up people when it comes to your experience. You know, somebody says, man, I really have a bad. Oh, you think you have a bad. Let me tell you about how bad I've got it. (laughs) And then you end up constantly putting yourself down. You see, this is the negative psychic in you, the, 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 the negative psychic, the one that can always tell the future is going to be bad. That's the negative psychic. The future is always going to be bad. We need to we need to fire that psychic. We need to stop st- stopping at Sister Rita's reading advisor, you know, her house with the with the neon lights that say Sister Rita's, you know, re- spiritual advisor. Stop stopping at her house and, and ha- letting her tell you the future. Your future is in Christ. Your past is washed away in Christ. Your present is you can do all things through Christ, which strengthens you. Let me tell you something about this. This victim mentality tells you that it's always somebody else's fault that you're in the situation you're in. And so Jesus is like, enough is enough. I don't want to hear your sob story anymore. Get up, pick up your bed and walk. And the Bible says immediately the man 
he became well. He picked up his pallet and he walked. Now, where did he walk? I want you to see something good about this guy. Like, no, it's never too late for anybody. There's something very powerful about this guy after he gets healed. You know what he does? He goes to church. You know, the first thing that every one of us should do when we get up is we should go to church. Look at what it says in verse 14. We jump down there and then could pick it up in Philippians and get this really across to you. Afterward, Jesus found him where? Look at what it says in verse 14. Afterwards, Jesus found him where? Where did you? Some of you don't want to say it because you don't want to admit it. Like, well, you're, you're already here, so you're one, you're the ones that do want to admit it. Maybe you're just tired. Jesus found him where? In the temple. That was the modern day church at that time. That was the church for the Jewish people at that time. We're the church now. Uh, the churches are the church. Christian Christianity is the church of God. Um, but Jesus found him in the temple. So he was smart enough to go, you know what? I've been lame for 38 years. The first thing I'm going to do is get plugged into church, get planted in the house of God. And it's interesting. Jesus found him in the temple. So guess where Jesus was? Where did Jesus go to the temple? The busiest man in the world, the most important man, the busiest man, the smartest man, the wisest man, the most perfect man in the universe still knew he still knew that he needed to go to church. Hi, you guys that are watching me and you could be here. I love you. But Jesus finds him in the temple because Jesus, Jesus found himself in the temple because he believed in going to church. And this man's in the temple. And notice what Jesus said. We went we went over this, but it bears repeating. He says, you look, you've become well. Now do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. Don't sin anymore. So nothing worse happens. You don't sin anymore. How could Jesus tell him to never sin again or something worse is going to happen to him? Because Jesus wasn't talking about everyday sins. He was talking about the sin that the man was already guilty of. And he got up and was healed. What was his sin? Jesus interrupted his sin when he started making excuses. His sin was making excuses and having the same mentality of blaming other people for his condition. He said something worse is going to happen to you if you keep sinning, if you keep blaming and making excuses. Here's what's worse. What's worse than being lame for 38 years, having your legs, but still making excuses, having your legs, but still blaming other people, having your legs, being able to walk, but still blaming other people, being able to walk, but still having that victim mentality. That's what's worse. And that's the sin that Jesus is identifying. We know the guy's going to sin. We know we're all going to make mistakes. I mean, you know, the guy has legs now. What's the first thing he's going to do? He's going to start walking and find himself a lady. He's been 38 years in that condition. (laughs) 38 years, man. He's got his legs now. So let me show you something very powerful. These mindsets, these belief systems that we have to that we have to 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 dismantle. And I want to take you to Philippians chapter one, because there's something that we need to understand about There's there's like four or five things I want to point out here from Philippians so that you see how to um, stop suffering. You see, you will stop suffering when you change your beliefs. I want to take you through several beliefs from the book of Philippians. It's probably this book is the greatest masterpiece ever written on escaping the victim mentality and escaping the the mistaken beliefs that oppress you and make you suffer. This book is the masterpiece on dealing with the victim mentality. And the reason why it is, the reason why this is the this is the more than conquerors book, this 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 book, this letter to the Philippians is is the um, is the it's the greatest manual on how to um, how to believe against no matter what's happening in your life. So here's the here's the deal. Paul is in prison 
the, the year is about 62 A.D. It's 60 years after Jesus came to the earth, after he was born, 60 years, so 30 years later after his death, approximately. And and Paul is in prison for preaching the gospel. And notice what Paul says. Paul says in verse one, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, Jesus to the saints in Philippi, including the overseers and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. Now, notice what Paul does here is he he's literally in jail. And the first thing he does, and this is the first belief system that we have to break. The first thing Paul does is he refuses to let his circumstances dictate his belief. He refuses to let his circumstances dictate his beliefs. In other words, now that he's in jail, he could have the belief that, oh, man, look at what God did to me. I can't believe God. I can't believe God's punishing me. I can't believe the Philippians didn't help me. I can't believe the Roman Christians. They let me they, they let this happen to me. I can't believe my own guys, Timothy and Titus didn't help me and nobody helped me. I'm in this bad situation. I'm in prison now and I can't believe that nobody prevented this. You see, Paul does not recognize freedom as being something that's external. He recognizes that freedom is a belief system. Freedom is believing that nothing can stop you. Nothing that happens in your life has to has to alter what you believe. You can truly believe that God is good no matter what happens in your life. You can truly believe that God is with you no matter what happens in your life. You can truly believe that God that God is on your side and God is going to have his way and have his will be done no matter what is happening in your life. We must refuse. This is what being in prison did not cause Paul to suffer. What would have caused him suffering was believing that his prison, that prison could could change what he believed. But he refused to allow his circumstances to dictate what he believed. I want you to go today with the belief. I want you to go today when you leave here today, refuse to let your circumstances dictate what you believe. When the doctor says, hey, I'm sorry, but we got bad news. I refuse to let the circumstances dictate what I believe. I believe I'm healed by his stripes anyway. When your checkbook says, man, you're running out of money, uh, you know what? And you start to believe this this idea that you're going to you're, you're going to run out and you're not going to have enough. Where's the suffering? The suffering doesn't come from the fact that you're low on money. The suffering comes from believing that God won't provide. So the suffering goes away when you believe my God shall supply all my needs according to your riches and glory, which, by the way, is also in Philippians. My God will supply all my needs that that no matter what I'm going through, my God is still going to supply no matter how much I lack. My God is going to supply. You see, I refuse to let my circumstances dictate. And Paul is saying, I refuse to let my circumstances dictate what I believe. I'm in prison, but I'm freer than I've ever been. I'm in prison, but I still believe. Verse six, I am confident that he who began the good work in you will finish it until the day of Christ Jesus. You see, he refused to question that the God who started this work in his life and in their lives, that somehow he's changed his mind. No, Paul refuses to change his belief. He refuses to let his circumstances dictate what he believes. God is still going to finish what he started. He's going to finish what he started. He's going to finish what he started. He's going to finish what he started. Paul refuses to let his circumstances dictate what he believes. Secondly, Paul refuses to let his circumstances change his opinion of people. He refuses to let his circumstances change his opinion of people. You know, sometimes when people don't come through for us, we get a sour attitude about people when people fail us, when people let us down, when bad things happen, we begin to take out our emotions on others. We begin to feel like it, people are, you know, people should have done this for me or done that for me. But Paul refuses to let his circumstances change his opinion of people. He still says he still says to them in verse three, I thank God for you. I thank God for you. 
no matter what you go through in life, don't let your circumstances change your opinion of people. People are good. People are good. Yes, they have a sinful nature, but God wants to God. God will make people. God will give people a new heart. God will save the lost. God will heal the sick. God will restore the broken. God can change anybody. Paul was Paul was uh, uh, uttering threats against Christians. He was supporting the murder of Christians and now he's changed. So he refuses to let his circumstance, even though he's in jail, he refuses to let his circumstances change his opinion of people, believe in people, realize something about people, that people are not problems to solve. People are people are created to be enjoyed, not to be seen as problems to solve, but people to be enjoyed, people to be enjoyed, people to thank God for. God wants to surround you with people that you can thank God for. You need to be thankful for the people in your life. Listen, we need to be thankful for the people in our lives. Paul is thanking God. He's in prison, but he's thanking God for the Philippians. You know, I thank God for you. You might have some messed up things going on in your life. I might have some messed things, messed up things going on in my life. Don't let what's going on in your life change what you believe about me. God's going to finish what he started in me. And I'm not going to let whatever's happening in your life is not going to change what I think about you. God's going to finish what he started in you. God's faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful. When I pray for you, when I pray for you, it's not, oh, God, help him. When I pray for you, it's, oh, God, thank you. I, I, I'm, I, I swear, I, I thank God for you guys. I thank God for Life Changers Church. This church is not going to let this city have its way. We're going to turn this city into the, a, a city of go- the gospel being glorified, where Jesus is glorified. We're not letting the devil win. Amen. We're not letting the devil win. We're going to impress ourselves upon the city rather than letting the city impress itself upon us. We're going to leave our mark in our community rather than letting the community leave its mark on us. We're going to leave our mark on what the devil meant to destroy the city. And God is going to use us to restore the city, to restore our communities, to restore our families, to restore what's been lost, to restore what's been broken. We're not giving up on people because God didn't give up on people. Don't give up on people. Pray for them. Don't ever quit on people. Believe in them. Believe that God's going to finish what he started. Thank God for people. They're in your life so you can become thankful. They're in your life so you have somebody to thank God for. They're in your life so maybe they can stir something up in you so you can thank God. Maybe somebody screwed up something about your life. Maybe somebody blew it. Maybe somebody messed you up. Maybe somebody mistreated you. Of course, we've all had that happen. What should we do? We should thank God anyway, because somehow what the what the enemy sent to defeat us, God bent to complete us. We have to refuse to let our circumstances change how we see people. People are precious. People need prayer. People need somebody to believe in them. People need our encouragement. I read a tweet from somebody that said, I, they sent it to my son. They said, I remember your dad like I don't know how many years ago, seven or eight years ago. I remember meeting your dad at college. So when I visited my son in college, I met some of his friends and one of his friends said recently, I remember meeting your dad when I was in college and he said, hey, man, don't don't ever stop smiling. Keep smiling. It's great. He said, I remember that left an impression in his life, like somebody just to believe in somebody. And this guy, if you met him, he's the happiest guy in life. I don't know if I had anything to do with it, but he's the happiest guy you'll ever me. And I'm telling you, folks, is that just telling somebody some small word of encouragement will keep going in their life. They'll remember it. Believe in people. Never stop encouraging people. Never stop believing in people. Never stop being like being optimistic about people there that God can finish it. God can do it. God can change anybody. God changed Saul into Paul. He changed. He changed my life. If he can change me, he can change anybody. Don't give up on people. Don't give up on people. Don't give up on yourself. Paul's in prison. He could say, man, he could beat himself up. Oh, man, I can't believe I did that. What I did to get him thrown in prison. He doesn't start questioning himself, second guessing himself. He said in verse 12, look at verse 12. He says, listen, I want you guys to know that my circumstances, what were his circumstances? He's in jail. He said, my circumstances 
have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. My circumstances have turned out for the greater progress. Refuse. Number three, refuse to let opposition blind you of the opportunity. Refuse to let opposition blind you to the opportunity. In other words, wherever there's opposition, there will always be opportunity. Wherever there is crisis, there's opportunity. You know, the Chinese character for crisis, the Chinese letter symbol for crisis is also the same letter for or the same symbol for opportunity. So what looks like a crisis is always an opportunity. So whatever bad you're going through, whatever's bad in your life, there's going to God's going to turn it around for greater progress. God's going to turn it around for the good. I believe that all things work together for good. God causes all things to work together for our good. Joseph said, man, you, you guys meant evil for me, but God meant it for good. What the devil sends to defeat you. God bends to complete you. What the enemy said, I know I've said it a thousand times here, what the enemy sends to defeat you, God bends to complete you. Believe that. Believe that. Refuse. Refuse to believe that your circumstances control your opportunities. No matter what the circumstance is, there, there is always an opportunity in any circumstance and in any situation, God can turn it into something good. Believe that. Believe that. Believe that. Refuse. Paul refused to become ungrateful. I thank my God. I thank my God. I thank my God. He calls him his God. You see, never lose that personal relationship, like that, that that awareness of your personal relationship with God. Never see him as the God. See him as your God. Amen. He says in verse three, I thank my God. He later says in Philippians chapter four, my God shall supply. He doesn't just say God will supply. He says, my God shall supply like he doesn't lose his perspective of his personal relationship with God. Don't ever lose your perspective of your personal relationship. You he's your God. He's your God. He says in uh, he says, um, where is it in, in Psalm? In Psalm 91, I'm almost done here. Just hang on for a second. In Psalm 91, he says, um, Remember, he says he who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty whose power no folk can withstand. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God in who I will trust. He's my refuge. He's my fortress. He's my God. Paul understands that personal relationship. He doesn't lose his perspective that he's your God. He's not just the God. He's your God. Boy, when you get a hold of that, he's my God. You go, he's my God. He's my God. He's my God. He's your God. He's my God. He's hey, whoa, whoa. He's your God. Yeah, he's my God, too. Hey, he's my God. Guess what? He's your God, too. He's your God. You got to own him as your personal. He's your personal Lord. He's your personal God. He's your your God. He's yours. You're his and he's yours. There's possession. There's personal relationship. There's connection. There's closeness. There's intimacy. He's mine. He's yours. And we get to call him my refuge, my fortress, my God in him. I will trust no matter he's in prison, but he's like, my God, I'm going to I'm thanking my God every time I remember you. I'm thanking my God for you. I thank my God for every remembrance of you. And finally, my last point just for today is refuse to let your history determine your destiny. Refuse to let your history determine your destiny. Paul says something very powerful in Philippians chapter three, verse 12. He says this in Philippians chapter three, verse 12. He says, look, not that I've already obtained or already become perfect, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which I've been laid hold of by Christ Jesus, forgetting, therefore, in verse 13, forgetting those things that I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting, 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 forgetting what lies behind, forgetting what lies behind and reaching to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal of the upward prize of God in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying, look, I've got some history, but I refuse to let my history determine my destiny. 
I want to encourage you today. There is nothing in your history. There's a lot of stuff in my history. There's a lot of stuff in your history, but there is nothing in your history that is greater than your destiny. There is nothing in your history that is greater than your destiny. Forget what lies behind. Reach forward. Press on towards the goal. I get it. You failed. You blew it. You took two steps back or you took a step back, but you're going to take two steps forward. You took 10 steps back. You're going to take 11 forward. You took 50 steps back. You're going to take 51 forward. You fell down, but you get up. Forget what lies behind. Your history will never be greater. There's nothing in your history that is greater than your destiny. And when you go out of here believing that here today, you're going to have joy no matter what's happening in your life. Let's stand together. I wish we had more time, but you know what? If we leave here knowing these things, I want you to say this out loud. Say, I refuse to let my circumstances dictate my beliefs. God is good and he will turn it around. I refuse to let my current circumstances dictate the outcome of my life. I refuse to let my current circumstances change my opinion of people. I believe in people. I believe in myself. I refuse to let opposition blind me of opportunity. There is always opportunity for God to show up no matter what it looks like. And I refuse to let my history determine my destiny. There is nothing in my history that is greater than my destiny. Say it again. There is nothing in my history that is greater than my destiny. One more time for everybody, everybody watching. There is nothing in my history that is greater than my destiny. And I am pressing on to walk in my destiny in Jesus name. Amen. Can we just thank God today? Hey, if you want to be saved, come up to the front. If you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, come up to the front. If you want to be healed of anything, come up to the front and one of our prayer partners will pray for you. Otherwise, we'll see you Wednesday for our night of thanks. Everybody gathering together Wednesday night, the night of thanks, 7 p.m. We'll see you then. God bless you guys. Love you. Thanks for coming.